if you refuse to recover, which is where all your gains happen, your body will hold on to your fat like an insurance policy and it will not let it go. Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today we're talking about the specifics of the female physiology and what protocols when it comes to diet and weight loss and energy work better for women comparatively to men. There are some differences, there's a lot of similarities, but there are some differences and some unique things that women need and can be paying attention to that we're not taught about in school in our sex ed classes or in basic anatomy 101. And we're gonna be talking about those things with Dr. Stephanie and Stima on the podcast today. I think you're gonna really enjoy this topic. If you're interested in topics of weight loss and energy, and, um, and eating according to your cycle, this podcast is for you. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Perot, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest is Dr. Stephanie Estima. We're inviting her for the second time on the podcast. It's an honor to have her here. Dr. Estima is an expert in female metabolism and body composition. She's a doctor of chiropractic with special interest in functional neurology, brain metabolism, and the specific application of the ketogenic diet and fasting according to what works for the female physiology. Using her framework, the STEMA method, she's particularly focused on distilling strategies in nutritional proxies, movement posture, and mindset to actualize human potential, health span, longevity, and achievement. Dr. STEMA, welcome back to the Broken Brain Podcast. I am so excited to be here, Drew. Thank you for having me back. You know, what's really exciting, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it, is that since having been on our podcast, you started your own podcast called Better. <laughs> Just yeah. big picture, how's that experience been? Like, what have been a couple highlights for you? Oh my gosh. I have to tell, like, starting a podcast has been a dream that I've put on the back burner for years. And when I finally closed my, uh, cl not finally, but I decided to make the decision to close my brick and mortar practice um, in 2019, that was the next logical thing for me. It was like, okay, we're taking this puppy off the back burner and I'm going to pursue it. So it's been... It's been so wonderful because one of my one of the things I love to do more than anything is to learn. I love learning. So when I have a guest on, I will spend hours pouring over their material, their body of work, and it's it's so wonderful for me to go on these like I call them like geeky magic carpet rides. Like we totally geek out on what they're, you know, what they're trying to bring into the world, how it came to be and you know, especially during this time where we're seeing a lot of, we were just kind of talking about this in the pre-chat around not really being able to see people as much. This has been a medium for me to still stay connected to people that I love, you know, admire and, and respect. So it's been, it's been lovely. That's awesome. Well, we'll definitely talk more about it. And one thing I want to reflect back upon you, both in your conversations and how you've showed up on our podcast here. Um, with the Broken Brain Podcast and just about my dealings with you. You know, we've had a chance to be friends now for a, a little over a year. And uh, what I've seen that you're incredible about and the feedback that we got from the first podcast episode that you were on where we talked about morning routines and a few other aspects about supercharging your brain health is you did such a fantastic job at breaking things down so that people actually knew like where to put their attention, cost versus energy put in, you know, return on investment per energy put in. And um, people really appreciate that. And you've carried that through your podcast. So I want to acknowledge you for that, uh, for just being a great teacher in that way. Thank you. I, I receive that. Thank you very much. So on that note, we're going to jump into another topic that's been so fascinating for our audience. And we've only given them a little bit of a taste. And that's how basically a lot of these things that we talk about in this po podcast, from diet to brain health to neuroplasticity, mindset, and, and like ketogenic and everything, how do we actually apply it to women from the female physiology standpoint? And I'm going to start off with just your own um, journey inside of there is that you had been working with patients, both men and women, and you saw something really interesting. Can you pick it up from there and tell us a little about what you were noticing? 
Sure. Yeah. So probably it was probably around the last time that uh, we were sitting and chatting for this podcast. I had started an online program at the time we were calling it the Keto Clean Program, and it was a ketogenic uh, program, lots of plants. So there's things that still haven't changed. There's lots of green leafy vegetables and resistant starches and things. But what I was noticing clinically was I would have, and we we started off with accountability groups. So we would you know match people up, and sometimes husband and wife uh, duos would come in, and they're like, "We're going to lose weight together. We're going to do this for our family." And one of the immediate patterns that I was able to discern was that men would just blink, you know, like I was saying to you before, it's like they would just kind of look around like, oh, okay, 30 pounds, it's all gone. Like, great, this has been amazing. And then the woman is like, we've been doing the same, eating the same damn food. We've been doing the same damn workouts. I've been counting my calories like you, and I've lost a pound, if that. So there was definitely a difference in terms of the immediacy, a, a lot of people would come to it for weight loss uh, or for energy, and there was a, the women seemed, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, on the surface, it looked like, you know, I had even a, a husband ask me, I think my wife is like cheating on the diet, like I don't think that she's actually following it. So we've had we've had this sort of uh, paradoxical difference in terms of the way that women and men responded to the ketogenic diet. And even myself, I was saying this to you, when I first started keto and I first started getting into the world of fasting, uh, several years before I started putting the online program together, I would push myself. You know, I would look at the literature and I'd say, okay, so like five day fast, autophagy, like let's go after it. And then I would completely mess up. Like I would notice that my periods would be a gong show like the next month or even, the, you know, two months following that. Um, so there was things in terms of my own personal evolution in terms of what I was trying and then what I was seeing in clinic uh, that prompted me to really take a bit of a, you know, a, a, a deeper dive into what are some of the differences? Like, why are we seeing, it's not that all women don't have the capacity to lose weight. It's not that all women don't have the motivation or the mindset or the willpower. There's something inherently different in the way that we respond to these interventions that are going to, um, you know, change the prognosis or change the way that they're going to, the, the outcome that they're looking for. So that's really what the, you know, we've morphed the keto clean into, uh, you know, now we just call it the Estima method because, I mean, there's, I don't, I'm not that creative. So if we have a better name, like, yeah, just Dr. Estima, just like the thing that I've done. So what we do now is it's, you know, we start off with like a nutritional, uh, a short therapeutic window of ketosis. And then from that, for the women, we immediately move them into changing the macronutrient composition and caloric intake um, of the diet through the ebbs and flows of their, of their menstrual cycle. So zooming at a high level, you know, we've had guests like Dr. Lisa Moscone on the podcast. Oh, you know, she's great. Yeah. Awesome. You know, women's brain researcher. Mm -hmm. And her, uh, part of her story that she talks about in the book, The XX Brain, is that, you know, for a long time, like a lot of these studies, for well-intentioned reasons, were done primarily on men because it was thought that you shouldn't be studying women of childbearing age because you could interfere with a lot of different processes, which there was some historical evidence around um, drugs having done that previously. Yeah. But then we excluded women from a lot of, especially the, because of the default and the historical uh, reasons that women were impacted by these uh, studies, we've excluded them, especially when it comes to a lot of the lifestyle research that was out there. So her, her point is that we have to really actually look at what works for women because it may be different. That doesn't mean that women are not as capable. That doesn't mean that they can't do as much as men are. It might mean that just there are differences that are there. So in your beginning of the research and starting to question and scratch your head a little bit and say, what's going on here? What were some of the foundations of what you found out regarding those differences of how women's bodies might react differently than men's bodies to some, some of these interventions? Uh, this is a great question. So I would say that I echo uh, Dr. Moscone's views in that when we look at the literature, save for obesity. So when we look at interventions for obese uh, women, there's there's a lot of literature that suggests that some of these applications like long-term fasts or you know macronutrient restriction like carbohydrates or fasting mimetics are appropriate. But when we look at 
women of a normal uh, body mass index, of a normal weight, who are also looking to get a piece of that longevity pie, who also want to reap some of these benefits that a ketogenic diet may have on uh, promoting healthy brain aging, like uh, Dr. Moscone's uh, work surrounds, or if we want to think about um, how we can keep um, you know, our mobility and flexibility and physical body um, well and good over the course of our lifetime, it's actually very hard to find that research. So this is where I always, and like you were saying, you know, a woman in her reproductive years is generally considered a confounding variable because her, the ebbs and flows, like the changes of her hormonal status over the course of her cycle is considered something that can't be controlled for and therefore uh, are often excluded. Even, you know, big trials, like when we look at metformin, which is a really popular drug that is used for type 2 diabetes and for controlling blood sugar, et cetera, women are, have been excluded from these huge trials uh, because their periods are essentially considered a confounding variable. So this is where it's really important for clinicians where we want to make a, a big distinguish, uh, you know, a, we want to distinguish between information, which is the information that we extract from the literature that's been published, and application, which is the understanding of the female workings and tr uh, the trials and the errors that we, that we play around with in clinic and with our clients uh, in order to affect the results that we're trying to get. Uh, so to answer your question, that's sort of a long-winded. Um, oh, it's great. It's great. It's great pre-knowledge because we're trying to have the right context around this conversation because for the person who's listening, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, chances are you listen to other podcasts that are out there and you know that sometimes people who are very inspirational and great at their work and have put in the time and effort in, in researching whatever intervention they have come on this podcast and are touting maybe a dietary approach, a way of life, a fasting protocol. And to be a little bit more of a conscious consumer of information, just even the fundamental aspect of looking under the hood and saying, well, what research is this based on? And were women part of this research? Were women part of the research? And can we replicate these studies in real life? Because when we have these controlled environments, you know, whether it's you're looking at rodents or you're looking at humans in the lab, you know, some of those things aren't always, you can't always control for those things in, in real life. So it's important. Um, it's a really important uh, sort of caveat or asterisk that I like to talk about. It's like information is one thing. Application is, is quite a different animal. So you know, lot, not a lot of, not a lot of uh, research around women who are of a healthy uh, BMI. And a lot of my information or a lot of my protocols are based now on my clinical, uh, my experimentations on myself, my N of one. But then once I started seeing uh, things were working with me, I started bringing those things to my, uh, you know, the women that I was working with and playing and tweaking and, and sort of always rejigging it until I was able to figure out something that was able to work generally ac across the board. And then of course, course, you sort of, you know, tweak and nuance it for, for the individual, but that's, that's how I, that's how I, my method was. Yeah. And clinical, born. clinical experience is part of the research bucket, right? It's yes. doctors yeah. like you that are out there that are trying to figure out what works. Then of course we can take it to the next level. If people want to publish case studies like Dr. Dale Bredesen with some of his Alzheimer's patients or Terry Walls with some of her Walls protocol patients in MS, and that can be the inspiration that helps raise money to then do a full bigger trial that's there. So this is all part of the process. It's not just that we have to somehow arrive at clinically published studies as the only way of research. Uh, like, yeah. like that's just one form of research, clinical experience. They're working with patients one-on-one -on -one is another form of research. So in you playing with it and also looking at it, what, what were some of those the, what were what some of the foundation of the material in understanding the female physiology that you took into account in how you adapted your protocol? So the first thing was that women don't do well being in ketosis forever. And I know that I'm probably going to be shocking some of the you know, ketogenic. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of people online who really believe that that's how our ancestors ate. That's how we have to be all the time. And I, I do not think that that is healthy for a woman's uh, neurotransmitters. I don't think that she can stay on it uh, for as long as, as people can sometimes uh, purport them to be. 
I think that she can kind of go in and out of it and initiate metabolic flexibility. And we'll talk about, you know, maybe we'll talk about some of the, uh, some of the specific tenants in terms of like week by week for a woman in her reproductive years. But I like her to cycle in and out of a traditional ketogenic diet and play with her proteins and her carbohydrates in order to drive other things like muscle protein synthesis and, uh, and more anabolic, uh, like muscle growth and, and, and maintenance there. So that was the first thing. So the first thing was that women would, uh, they weren't able to stay on in that state of ketosis indefinitely. And they would often like kind of around the three or four week mark, this is when I would start to have women say, you know what, I don't know what it is, but I just want like a cheeseburger or a pizza or like, I just want, like, I don't care how much fat you give me. Like I just need carbohydrates. So one of the things that we added in, so one of the things I realized that was happening was that her uh, microbiome was starving. So often when we think about the microbes, uh, particularly in the large intestine, um, when we restrict carbohydrates for a long period of time, then that we are also restricting the food supply to the microbiota in the large intestine. So one of the ways, one of the workarounds was to add in uh, resistant starches uh, for these women. So resistant starches, uh, just like you know, my 30 second elevator pitch on like why they're super important. I'm sure you've discussed them before, but they are, they are starches like carbohydrates that resist digestion, but they act as a food source for the microbiota, particularly in the large intestine. So they're not broken down on the small intestine, like most of our, uh, a diet is the large the large intestine those those microbes uh, they kind of gobble it up and then that helps reduce your cravings it improves your satiety or your feelings of fullness uh, they also release a short chain fatty acid called butyrate which is going to help with like a whole host of things like gut permeability beauty sleep skin hair and nails like the lot so um, adding in resistant starches. Um, was really great um, in terms of cur like curbing the uh, cravings. And then once we started altering the macronutrient and caloric um, intake through the cycle, we were also able to start profiting off of some of the different, you know, when testosterone peaks, when estrogen reaches her peak, when we see progesterone rising in the luteal phase, then we were also mimicking and matching her energetic needs with her, uh, with her foods. So those were sort of the, you know, one, two, three uh, big observations that I made. So, so let's unpack some of that. Uh, the podcast has grown a ton in the last, like, basically since a little bit before COVID. So there's some new listeners that are like, wait, I think I kind of know what ketogenic diet is, but I'm not exactly sure. So give us, just like you did with resistance starch, what's the breakdown of ketogenic and why, have, why has it become such a big thing? Yeah, so you'll you'll see in the particularly in the you'll, in the functional neurology and neurologists and people who are really concerned with uh, brain health and promoting healthy brain aging, we tend to love ketogenic diets. So one of the big reasons is, you know, your when we think about the different energetic sources that we use to produce energy. Um, we typically will either use carbohydrates or we, well, we'll use carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So when we take, we can either, you know, take those from our diet. So what we would call exogenous sources of energetic substrates, right? So the carbohydrates break down into glucose, the proteins break down into amino acids, uh, the fat breaks down into free fatty acids, and then uh, eventually ketone bodies. So whenever you're having, uh, whenever you're consuming a carbohydrate, uh, your body is going to use that first. Uh, so it's going to break that down into glucose because it's the easiest to do so that it can now send, get glucose into the cell in order to produce energy. Now, and, and I, again, like people like to poo poo insulin and pe like, they like to, you know, say that it's the devil. And in some ways it can be when it, when it's abused, when we're only eating really processed carbohydrates, when we're eating excess carbohydrates, we will increase our fat synthesis. Um, but insulin, when it's used appropriately, can actually be a really great anabolic pair to in increasing pro like when you're eating protein and insulin, you can actually drive uh, some really great things like growing new muscle, which I hope we'll get to talk to about today. But when you're in a ketogenic state, what you're doing is you're eating way more fat than you are proteins or carbohydrates. And the theory around this is that you are going to be using fat. It's going to break down into free fatty acids, which are now going to be the energetic substrate or the, the precursor to making energy or ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And that 
when we, that can be, the free fatty acids can be used in most organs in the body except for the brain. So the brain can't use fatty acids. The fatty acids have to go through another cycle through the liver where they, where we now produce free fatty acids will get transformed into something called a ketone body. So a ketogenic state means that you are generating ketone bodies and that can be taken up by the red blood cells and that can be taken up by the brain as a, um, as a mechanism for creating energy. Now, the brain can never only 100% run on ketones. There has to always be some amount of glucose, but you don't have to be taking it in, in the form of carbohydrates. Your body can actually make its own glucose from uh, fatty acids. So uh, being in a ketotic state or being in a ketogenic state, is a, it's a harder state to kind of get into because your body will always use carbohydrates that you're taking in from external sources first. But if you restrict that, if you restrict that supply of carbohydrates that are coming in, you will now use your own stored forms of carbohydrates, which, are called, which is called glycogen. So we see glycogen stored in the liver, uh, in, the, in the muscles. Those are kind of the two big depots for them. And then once that runs out, um, you have you know somewhere between a 24 at the very most, like a 48 hour storage of, of glycogen. Then you will start tapping into your fat cells um, or the fat that you're taking in from your diet as the uh, substrate or as the a precursor for creating energy. And that's kind of what we want. If you have, if you are losing, if you want to lose weight, where you want to lose weight is from your adipose tissue. We, we don't want to be losing, we don't want to be using our muscles, right? That's functional tissue. That's super, super important. We want to preserve that at all costs. So we want to be, if the, if the goal is weight loss, um, or even if it's like improved energy, mood, clarity of thought, uh, improved lipid profiles. Like there's been all sorts of studies that that have uh, that have emerged in the past like five or ten uh, years around the benefits of being at least in a temporarily ketotic state, um, and why that's really important for brain health. Why it promotes. Why we can think about this as being a very heart healthy way of eating, and why it can contribute to weight loss if that's something that's a goal for you. Um, but also energy. I mean, energy is such a big thing and that probably the number one thing that I hear from women, like a lot of women will come to me and say, listen, I want to lose weight. I want to, uh, you know, get rid of the extra, you know, whatever it is that they're carrying. But when you dig a little deeper, you know, most women, and I think this is true for men as well, but I can only talk about my experience as a woman and like the women that have told this to me is that they just want to feel good in their skin. You know, like they just want to like feel good in their skin again. And the ketogenic diet is a really great way of, you know, giving you weight loss, but also creating some of the, this physiological landscape for you to be able to switch between using sugar uh, or glucose as your primary energy source, but also being able to tap into the fat stores, take the triglyceride out, break it up, and then use that as an energetic source as well. That's great. That's a great overview. And I think it sets up the next part really well, which is now that we understand like ketogenic diet, the role, why somebody would want to tap into it. And the other layer that I add in is that we in America and the Western diet, we've gotten so far on carbohydrates and glucose as a primary fuel source because yeah. the government recommended, you know, uh, in, in North America, and now it's a Western diet. You can see it in India. You can see it in a lot of places that are starting to become Westernized. We have so much of our diet is sugary, is carbohydrates, is wheat, is pasta, is these things that have all sorts of cascading effects on our weight, our ability to focus, and our long-term um, health span. Um, so now that we understand that, Help us, give us some of the basics because you talked about the, you talked about a few phases of the cycle that are there. What are some of the things that women are going through because they have a menstrual cycle, at least the ones that are of childbearing age, that is unique in how the next piece of the conversation will fit in, which is how we put the two of those things together. So talk about those phases of the cycle and give our listeners a little bit of a refresher of what they are and why they're important. I have to tell you one of the things that I have noticed. So if I go and speak to, you know, corporate, you know, in a corporate setting, or, you know, if I'm just giving a talk, the one thing that I have noticed, which 
um, I'm on a mission to eradicate is women, you know, other than like a few, you know, awkward hours in high school where they had to learn about their cycle, really have no clue about what's going on. And I think that when we think about, um, um, I, I typically work like I, maybe I attract like the type of person that I am, but like I typically attract like super type A, like driven, super, uh, they want to be able to make like huge changes in the world and they have no clue about their menstrual cycle and how their moods and their energy and their sleep and all these things change. So I'm so glad that you brought this up because I think that as women, there's almost this forgotten art that or this just recognition that we're not just smaller archetypes of men with like more pesky hormones. We actually work differently. And there's, you know, different areas of the brain. We have different sizes. We have like our liver works differently. Like there's all these different things. And of course, you know, the fact that we have a, you know, a menstrual cycle makes us really unique. And I, I would love if there's one thing I would love um, for the women that I work with or anyone that's listening to this today is just for you to honor your uniqueness because, you know, and we're not saying like one is better than the other. We're just saying like you're different and you need to honor that. So uh, just with that preamble, um, when we think about the uh, when we think about the menstrual cycle, uh, typically it's easy to describe it in sort of four different weeks, right? So we have four kind of different events that are happening. Um, the first week we typically ascribe like day one is the day that you get your period, right? So that's the bleed week. Um, is how I typically refer to it. And when we look at the hormonal environment there, your, your biology is like, okay, there's no pregnancy. We got to get rid of this endometrial lining. We got to scrap it and we got to start anew. So when we look at the hormones that are there, we see estrogen is quite low. Progesterone's on vacation. She's somewhere in Tahiti sunning. We have luteinizing hormone is not there. Um, testosterone is very low as well. The only hormone that's really active during your bleed week is something called follicular stimulating hormone or FSH follicular stimulating hormone for short. And what that hormone does um, is it kind of the name sort of describes it. It stimulates the follicle. So your follicles, we have all these follicles with little uh, potential eggs uh, inside them. And FSH is going to be driving the maturation of uh, there's going to be and there's going to end up being just one um, one star one egg that gets released um, and that's what um, we see typically in that first week. So we see all the hormones are typically low, um, and then we see FS, FSH. We start to see estrogen rising towards the end of that week, and then into week two, which is your week before ovulation, we see estrogen reach her biggest apex of the entire cycle. So, you know, some women I've seen them go like on labs, like from like five picograms per deciliter in week one to like 200 picograms per deciliter in week two. Like it's an astronomical rise in estrogen uh, in week two. We also see in that week before ovulation, testosterone also rises. So this is... Um, I always like to give people like a little crude, it's a crude measurement, but you know, week two, I often call it like flirty, sexy, and horny. Like you should feel like your interest, your libido, you know, you, your interest in having sex and lots of orgasm should be high. And if it's not, uh, if you sort of notice the same sort of, um, there's no kind of peak that week, then we may want to be looking into, uh, you know, whether or not your testosterone levels are, um, are what they should be. And fun little fact, testosterone is actually the most abundant sex hormone um, in the female body. We, we often ascribe estrogen as like the phenotypically female, right? And of course it is, and it has, you know, uh, effects, certain effects in, in the female body that it doesn't in the male. Um, but we, testosterone is actually our most abundant sex hormone. That peaks in week two. And then we also see luteinizing hormone peak in week. She, like, she comes out of nowhere, right? She comes there and she, her job is to basically pop the egg out of the um, uh, of the follicle, so I I often you know when I'm trying to help people remember like what what does what, um, and maybe this is just me basing this off of my own family, but I have this uncle, and he <laughs> so we well you know at Easter or whatever family dinner Thanksgiving what have you he sort of comes in late you know he comes in right after everyone's you know sat down to eat and he'll be like Stephanie how are you and like he hits me on the back of my you know, back. And uh, like, there was one time that I like, you know, had to spit out my food and that's basically luteinizing hormone. It's like the awkward uncle that bursts in, gets the, uh, gets the egg out, um, and then goes away. Uh, so that's week two. 
Uh, by the we, way, these are very helpful because this is how people remember things, right? Yeah. Traditionally, this is how memory works. We do associations. We do, we do memory sort of associations or physical associations or stories or other things. So these are great. Keep them coming. All right. Awesome. So uh, my nerdiness is welcome here is what I'm like. My geekiness <laughs> is welcome here. <laughs> so after we ovulate and that's actually, um, o- ovulation happens sometime between, you know, day 12, day 14, maybe day 15. The main point of your cycle, I know that we count your menstrual cycle from the day that you start your period, like that's day one of your cycle, but the whole main event is ovulation. That's it. Like whether or not you want a baby, your cycle is driving this release of the egg in the hopes that it will meet a sperm uh, and, and that that union will create a pregnancy. So the whole point of your cycle is ovulation. So after ovulation, like those first two weeks that we've been describing, that's what's called the follicular phase. So it's like the, you know, the era of the follicle. The second two weeks is called the luteal phase. And that's because we are naming it after the artist formerly known as the follicle, right? So this is now the corpus luteum. And the luteum is, the corpus luteum is now going to start secreting progesterone. So immediately after ovulation, Testosterone comes down, estrogen comes down, and then progesterone and estrogen kind of around the middle of that third week start to rise again. So we get progesterone up and she's like the, you know, she's like the super cool hormone. She slows everything down. Everything is chill, slows down your bowel, tends to stimulate your appetite, um, helps with really great sleep. So you'll often find like the best sleep of your whole cycle happens towards the end of week three, maybe the beginning of week four, you'll get the best deep sleep. If you ever, if you wear, you know, wearables like the aura ring or something, you'll notice that your deep sleep is quite good that week because progesterone and her sister estrogen are up there trying to drive that healthy sleep. And then as we move into week four, um, the week right before uh, your period, about halfway through, so you know the typical length of a um, cycle somewhere around 29 days. Um, so let's call it like day 24, 25. If there is no fertilized egg, then progesterone drops, estrogen drops with her. And then we have a whole host of other things that come down as well. So serotonin drops, glutathione, you know, your B vitamins drop, vitamin D uh, drops, and then the endometrial lining, which has been building up, um, is now, because progesterone has been sort of keeping it alive, those cells now become ischemic, meaning that, that they're not getting the oxygen that they need, they die, and then the shedding happens the day that you start your bleed. So that's kind of like what happens. That's normally what happens. There are a lot of different permutations in terms of you know, where we can, you know, if our estrogen is higher relative to our progesterone, if we have too much androgens that are not switching into, there's so many different kind of permutations in terms of where things can go wrong, but that is what a normal cycle should um, look like. So a couple things that I always like to uh, tell women is information is so important. So tracking your period, like I use, um, I have no affiliation with them, but I love the Clue app, C-L-U-E. You know, you just kind of pump like, you know, when you get your period, how you're feeling, if there's cervical mucus, what your skin looks like, what your hair looks like, how your bowel movements are, all that kind of stuff. Um, And so you have a sense of how long your period is because we, you know, you can have anything from like 26 to, you know, call it 33 or 34 days would be considered normal. So you really want to know what that is for you. Um, And then you also really want to pay attention to the quality of your uh, blood. I always say like the bleed is like your hormonal report card, right? So if you have really heavy flow, uh, if there's like gobs, like if you see like a lot of clotting or it's like really like gobby in your uh, period, that may be, you know, an indication that there was too much estrogen in that second half of your uh, uh, second half of your cycle. Um, if you need to change your pad uh, more often than, or like, you know, your Dixie cup or whatever you're using, uh, you know, e- like more than every three hours. Um, for me, I used to, um, when I would go into the clinic, if I, I used to start seeing patients at seven and I would bring two pairs of pants with me the first two or three days of my period, because I, at the time before I was kind of like awake to this idea that I should pay attention to my cycle, um, 
I would have like hemorrhagic light. It was like so heavy. I would almost always um, kind of leak through my, like it would go through everything. So I always had like spare backups um, for, um, uh, for practice. So um, those are kind of things to really pay attention to. Um, other things like other kind of general tips um, that I can give you is like, if you're also spotting the day before, like if you're kind of not sure when your period starts, if you're like, okay, is this it? Like it's kind of light pink. Um, and then it doesn't happen. And then it kind of comes a couple of days later. That may also be an indication that your progesterone levels are quite uh, are quite low as well. So you're starting to see some of that tissue that's like prematurely dying and kind of coming out like in spotting. Uh, you may see some spotting in your underwear. So those are kind of some general things to uh, to be aware of as well. And, and really all under the the conversation and the context that we're trying to set up for is that one, to be aware that these are phases that are there to get more information yeah. and to start tracking. Because it's when you start tracking that you can also look at problems that you might be encountering, like excess weight if you want to get rid of it. It could be if you are maybe enjoying some alcohol, but you feel really, really bad after drinking it, maybe you're having it at the wrong time mm -hmm. of your cycle because alcohol can, you know, it's not that great in general, but for people who do choose to drink, having it at certain times of the cycle might be, um, for women who choose to drink, it might be having it at certain times of the cycle might be better than other times that are there. So it's like being aware of this conversation, number one, as you had mentioned, and not feeling, first of all, men have no clue of this, right? And I can speak to, it's only through interviewing experts like yourself on the podcast that I really started to begin to understand this. And that's one of the privileges that are there. And I can say from my girlfriend to my sisters and other stuff. Well, maybe my sister a little bit because she's in functional medicine and nutrition, you know, getting her degree in nutrition. You've got a great but, family, actually. Like your mom, oh my gosh, I see her on your Instagram. I'm like, I need to squeeze her. She's so cute. <laughs> your mom, oh my goodness. Sorry. Yes, go thank on. you. Thank you. Shout out to my mom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but bottom line is that you shouldn't feel bad about not knowing this. Most people don't know it because the powers that were be that were in charge of educating and many of the doctors that are there don't really get a full explanation and education. In this. So it starts first with education. And the number one thing that you can do is, as you had mentioned, start even just tracking your period to see where you are and what's normal for you. From then, now we can get a little bit more sophisticated and we can get into things. So let's put the two of those together when it comes to optimizing some of the aspects that we've heard about, whether it be ketogenic diet or it might be fasting, and to really get the benefits. So much of it is around timing and understanding where in what phase of the cycle we should be applying these things. So give us a big picture, maybe take us through that calendar again and talk about what you could do to utilize some of these tools and what your body is craving or needing in general during some of these time periods. Sure. Yeah. And this is, um, I, I always like to give women like the permission and the runway, you know, it is one of the, one of the, you know, rites of passages as, as women is to get to know how your body works. And even between women, you'll see a lot of differences. So getting to know yourself and learning how to appropriately respond to whatever cycle, you know, part of the cycle you're in, whether we're talking about menstruation or we're talking about self-care, you know, what we're eating, how we're moving, you know, what we're thinking, how we're, how we're loving up on ourselves. It is, it is your right to feel good. So uh, give yourself the, you know, the runway to be able to learn about yourself and what your body and your cells require and expect of you. So when we talk about this in the context of nutrition, um, kind of going back to those four weeks again, when we think about the first week, that bleed week, like I said, all of your hormones are low. In particular, progesterone, she's not there right now, right? So progesterone is a potent app stimulator of your appetite. And actually, it's one of the best, you know, a lot of the women that I talk to, like the best part of getting my period is all the period poos because, you know, the progesterone like backs up your bowel movements. But then when you get the period, you have this like beautiful release. So progesterone's low. Um, so what we want to be thinking about, you know, the first couple of days for some women, there's like some cramping and some lethargy and like people kind of feel like a little um, crampy. But once you sort of like after day two or three and you're sort of in the, in the flow, pun intended, so to speak, uh, you may, this is a really great time to actually dive into uh, a ketogenic diet if you haven't tried it before or to engage in fasting. Because like I said, your, um, your, 
the hormone that is responsible for driving up your appetite is not there. So you can, you can afford to do some of these more. And when I say fasting, I should also just say not time restricted eating. So people will call like an intermittent fast. Like I think that you can do that all through your cycle. But when I say fast, I mean like a 24 hour fast or longer. So you can play with those parameters in that first week or kind of just get your toes wet and kind of see how it feels. Um, so I really like a ketogenic diet uh, in that bleed week. And when the way that we do it in the Estima diet or the Estima method is we do uh, what I call like the classic protocol, which is like a 70% uh, fat, a 20% uh, protein, and then a 10% uh, carbohydrate um, intake. So that's a really nice way to, you know, you can play around with it for a couple of days if you've never, never done it before, or if you're a seasoned ketogenic, you know, dieter, then you can kind of just jump right in when you're feeling like that lethargy lifts a little bit from that first day uh, or second day uh, of your period. When we move into the second week, so towards the end of the first week and now uh, full on in week two, as I mentioned before, you know, week two is like our extroverted week. We're sexy, we're flirty, you know, and we're, we're um, extroverted. This is the week where I mentioned before testosterone peaks. This is, this is the highest point that testosterone is going to make during our cycle. So I really like to profit off of increasing our like your protein intake to coincide with that testosterone apex because you know most people don't realize this but you can actually build muscle two ways. One is mechanically, right? The mechanical stimulus that you'll get going to the gym, resistance training. The other is through your diet. So when you are increasing your protein intake, you are going to drive, uh, you know, assuming that you get a sufficient amount of uh, an, an amino acid called leucine, you are going to drive something called muscle protein synthesis, which like the name suggests, it is synthesizing muscle protein. So this is super important for, you know, no matter how old you are, you know, what, you know, whether you are actually menopausal or not, this is actually really, really, uh, or you are in your reproductive years, building muscle is one of the ways that we can really take a, when we're, when we're taking a slant or we're taking a filter on longevity and health span, the more lean muscle mass that you can accrue, uh, the better off you're going to be in terms of independence, in terms of strength, in terms of pliability, in terms of bone density, in terms of brain health. Like there's so many things. So, you know, doing it both ways, like both the mechanical stimulus in the gym and the chemical stimulus through your diet. So I usually change up the macronutrient um, composition here. So I will, depending on the person, I'll either do like a 40, 40, 20. So like 40% fat, 20, uh, pardon me, 40% uh, protein. And then the fill is carbohydrate, like 20% carb, or I'll do like a, you know, a 50, 30, 20. So you'll notice that I've kind of upped the insulin or I've upped the carbohydrate there as well, because as we up our protein, we also want to up our, uh, uh, our carbohydrates so that we can get that anabolic effect that both the, um, the protein is going to give as well as pairing that with a carbohydrate. So that's kind of week two. Um, after we ovulate, we enter now into that luteal phase where the corpus luteum, that artist formerly known as the follicle, uh, is running the show and secreting progesterone as we move into week three and into week four. So I like to return here to a more uh, ketotic or ketogenic macronutrient composition with the caveat that you are now consuming your resistant starches. So if this is a week three that you are uh, in your cycle, um, I mentioned before, like women in like that week, when they're first doing keto, like week two, week three, week four, they're like, I don't know, I have these crazy cravings. I don't know what's going on. I need to, I need to have a pizza. Having the resistant starches here, so like I, I always recommend like a tablespoon of like a raw potato starch, or you can do um, a green plantain flour, green banana flour. Those are also good, uh, really easy. Like you can source those either on, you know, online retailers or your grocer typically has like the raw potato starch in the baking section. Um, having like a tablespoon of that, um, I, I always recommend having it in a smoothie, but I have to tell you, I have a, my online community of women. We have like 1100 women in there now. And I was like, you guys don't like, don't have it with water. It's like gross to have it. They all like to have it with water. So I don't know, maybe it's just me. I thought I could hide it in a smoothie, but you know, you can also, I guess if you're a gangster, just like put it in some water and, and shoot it back. 
So some resistant starches in week three. And then as we move into week four, uh, that week before your period, we sort of have half of the week where we have the apex of progesterone, apex of estrogen is there, lots of cravings. And as I mentioned before, um, we have all, if you were to take like some, if you were to do some blood work during that time, glutathione, your, your B vitamins, your D vitamins, uh, serotonin also drops. You'll also see an uptake of uh, protein uh, utilization, like amino acids are lower in the serum. You'll see lower glucose, uh, lower uh, free fatty acids. And that's because it's like all hands on deck. We got to build this endometrial lining. Um, so this is a time for us to relax a little bit in terms of our calories. I actually want you to increase your calories this week because you need it. You're building an organ, ladies. Like, let's not forget you build a new organ every single month uh, in the form of your endometrial lining. So it's not like I'm telling you to go get a pint of Ben and Jerry's, but you know maybe you're increasing it by 10, 15% of your regular caloric uh, consumption. And I also like to relax the... Um, uh, the macronutrient composition again. So it's, it's we have a, uh, a bit of a higher carbohydrate intake, a little bit of a higher protein intake because that also helps with satiety, help the, 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 the sense of feeling full with more, like the more protein you have, the more full you tend to feel. Um, so I'll do again, like a 40, 20, a 40, 40, 20, or like a 50, 30, like whatever the woman, like the, you have to play with it a little bit. Like it's, it's not like a cookie cutter. Everybody does this, but for the most part, most women do really well in like a 50, 30, 20, 40, 40, 20 kind of, um, breakdown. Um, and then they're also increasing their carbohydrates because you need it. You, you are your calories rather, because you need it. You're, you're, like I said, you're creating an organ, um, whether or not you want to, you know, is, is another conversation, but increasing that caloric intake uh, is going to help with you keeping on track and not just falling off the wagon and eating everything in sight, which is what I used to do. I used to, you know, think like I was saying to you in the pre-chat, like strong like bull. Like I used to think I could just power through, put my head down and like punch it out. And then by the end of week four, I was such a maniac. I was just like raiding the pantry and like, just ev- like, e- just get in my belly. It was like, whatever it was, just get in my belly. Um, and that was because I really wasn't honoring my own rhythms. Like I was trying so hard to stick to that ketotic, like so hard to keep those carbohydrates down, you know, trying to keep the calories down. And then I would mess up. And of course, you know, the internal, like the critic inside would be like, see, you're a loser. You can't do it. Da, da, da. But like ladies who are trying to do that, like, let's just cut some emotional cords here. You need more calories and just like release it. Like it's just, it's just physiology. Because as, as you said, like the contrast to honoring and eating according to your cycle would be trying to stick to something that's the same every day yeah. or stick to something that's the same type of macronutrient breakdown every day, thinking that's going to be the thing that's going to help you get closer. So yeah. when you started to do this for yourself, you know, you've, we were chatting a little bit earlier, as you mentioned, you were saying that um, you would have really terrible uh periods and bleeding and the worst. yeah you know, i'm sure i'm sure probably also like pms symptoms along with it you got right? it so mm-hmm. when you started to shift and eat it more in accordance with your cycle what were some of the changes that you noticed for yourself well the first thing um that I noticed uh, ver- my sleep was was getting better. So a lot of women will complain about sleep disturbances in that luteal phase. But what I was finding was as I was eating and as I was uh, changing the way that I was eating, um, my sleep was getting better, which was, I mean, for any woman, any mother, you know, this is like sleep is just like the holy, you know, it's the, it's the, 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 thing that you want the most in life is the, you know, this wonderful restful sleep. So that was the first thing. And then the other thing, like you mentioned, I had, you know, my, like my partner Giovanni would be like, okay, like slowly backing out of the room because he would just walk into the room wrong and I would be in tears and it would just be like this mess. Um, so uh, my mood was much more stable. So I was much, you know, and, in, in depending on the amount of stress that you're under, of course, I can influence things, but the the mood state, like the stability was one of the big things that um, that I noticed for myself. And then I was, and then I started when I was playing around with some of these protocols, I would go in, back to the clinic and I would say, okay, like I want you to try this and like I want you to take this 
uh, we have, um, uh, there's a really nice, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the link for it. It's called the, the Depression, Anxiety, and Stress um, score. So it's called the DAS, D-A-S-S. And this is a really nice subjective questionnaire that can give us understandings of how a woman, and I would give it to my women like all through their cycle. And of course we would see the DAS, like her scores would get um, lower uh, in that luteal phase. So we would I would start giving these women this, this DAS questionnaire and noticing as we were changing up her, their macronutrient um, uh, composition that their DAS scores were actually much more level, much more uh, even keel through the, um, through the month. So those were like the first two things. And the other thing that I also should say, um, and I don't know if we'll get to it um, today, but I, I also started changing the way that I exercise through the month as well. And I'm happy to talk about it if there's time. But that fourth week, I really do like to reserve it, particularly the second half of that fourth week for recovery. And as a recovering perfectionist, as a type A personality, I know how hard that is for so many women to be like, there's no way I'm just going to like put my head down and I'm going to do a soul cycle or whatever it is. And I'm going to, you know, do my hit training and whatever. But be forewarned, like buyer beware. If you if you refuse to recover, which is where all your gains happen, your body will hold on to your fat like an insurance policy and it will not let it go. So making sure that there's time in that week, uh, especially in that second half of that fourth week for recovery, for active recovery. So walks, uh, Pilates, uh, much more um, what I call, or not just what I call, but uh, what's called NEAT, so non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So like just, you know, cleaning like your mother-in-law's coming over, you know, like we all know how good we clean when like we have guests coming over, right? Like those kind of lower level activities where you're not sprinting or you don't have these like explosive uh, hit sessions because that is going to drive up your cortisol and it's also going to allow, not allow your body to release um, some of the fat uh, or excess adiposity that it may have. So for the women that you were working with that were in your clinic that were following these protocols like you know ketogenic diet or other components, you, you've, you've mentioned about weight loss, but what do you think it was doing that even though they were trying their best, what was going on in their body that they were that was preventing the weight loss piece from happening that can happen now that they're in accordance. I mean, weight loss has so many layers to it. There's so 100%. many factors that can contribute to it. Yeah. But big picture wise, what would be reasons why you would see that the men who would follow it, maybe, uh, you know, just anecdotally from the experiences that you had with working with patients, let's say you had a couple, the guy would just think it and start to see weight loss that was there. Obviously he was following the protocol too, but the woman would have some challenges. So what is going on? What mechanisms are happening that would actually support the weight loss function when we're eating in accordance to our cycle? So I think one of the things that I, I, I believe that this method of eating helps to solve is this constant stress response. Because every time, whenever you eat something, you know, it is a short-term investment in how you feel, you know, a medium-term investment in how you look, and then a long-term investment in terms of how you perform. But if you are constantly you know, restricting the carbs, no matter what, like there's, there's a time and a place to do that, right? If you are new to the ketogenic diet, we definitely want to be able to, you know, start turning the cogs in terms of your fat burning ability. So there's that metabolic shift or that metabolic flexibility that we want to allow you to step into. But once you've kind of accrued that skill, for a woman to constantly be restricting her carbohydrates, this is a stress response. And women in general, because of our reproductive function, whether or not you want to have babies, we are much more defensive of our fat stores. So, you know, you and I were talking, I had mentioned to you, uh, I think I may have mentioned this, this to you at a lunch or something, but I used to be a figure competitor. So I, you know, figure is kind of like a one-step uh, in terms of muscular, muscular development, like higher than bikini and then like a step or two down from bodybuilding. So sort of like, you know, if you look at uh, like Shape Magazine or um, Fitness Rx or something, uh, that's sort of the muscularity that they're kind of looking for. And 
I had driven through my nutrition and my training, my body fat so low that I actually lost my period. So I lost my period leading up to the show. I mean, I did really well. I placed third in like the tri-state area in you know New York, which I'm super proud of. But the fallout from that was that I didn't have a period for three months. Trying to get my period back online was like a complete gong show. And when we think about what was happening there, well, of course, I didn't have enough fat to actually maintain the regular menstrual cycle. And that is a stress response. You know, that is when we, when we kind of go back to and take an, uh, you know, an, an evolutionary or an ancestral lens. You know, if a woman, if there's famine, right, if there's like a lack of food, the, the, um, um, uh, the, per- the, the percentage or the probability of a woman being able to carry a pregnancy through to the end is going to be low. So we want to be thinking about for women, uh, we want to be giving them fat. We want to be making sure that we're not always stressed. Like there's times in the cycle, like that follicular phase, especially in that first week is a really great time to be more aggressive and like play with your ketogenic protocols. But you don't, it's not like that all through the month because what you're doing is you're sending a signal to your mitochondria, particularly in your ovaries. And, you know, we have like a hundred thousand, like per, uh, like there's like a hundred thousand mitochondria in, in a, in the ovaries. When we compare that to like the, the livers, like a hepatocyte has like 2000 mitochondria of, you know, a a heart cell has like a myocyte has like 5,000. So the, you are sending information to your mitochondria that there is famine. So they are going to shut it down because that is not what your bio, you are not designed to have a pregnancy in a low food environment. So women are much more defensive of our fat stores. We have much more, we have much more um, swings in our cortisol levels as well. uh, When we think about, um, you know, I mean, we can get into kind of some of the socioeconomic, um, uh, you know, things around uh, cortisol. But when we look at women, they tend to be the primary caregivers of children, right? Which is very different than the way it was, you know, hundreds of, uh, uh, you know, a, a years ago where we had children raised in a village with sisters and aunts and grandmothers and, you know, a- you know, mothers and everybody together. So we have a woman who's typically isolated, raising her babies by herself. She typically does most of the unpaid work in the home. So, uh, you know, she goes to work if she has, if she's, you know, has a job that she loves, she does that during the day. And then she comes home and then she's also doing the laundry and the cooking and the scheduling for the you know, the soccer runs and all these things. So she's also, she's burning, uh, you know, the, the candle, so to speak, at both ends all the time. So she's typically in a state of chronic low-grade inflammation or stress anyway. And then you layer on top of that, restricting her carbohydrates indefinitely, you know, your body is just going to say, no, thanks. Like, that's not, that's not how, that's not how we're designed to work. Um, so it's very important. And it's going to com- for- compensate appropriately. That could be low energy. It could be, as you mentioned, yeah. storing weight because it's not sure the next time that it's going to have the ability to fuel itself. It could be a combination of things that could have cascading effects on our overall health. You know, and again, you were talking about losing your period when you were um, getting ready for uh, this 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 shaping uh, competition figure, and figure yeah. figure competition and similarly women will see that when they're training for a marathon or in the case of some communities that think that they're actually eating the diet that's healthy for them are doing super low fat vegan i know that's kind of how i got my start into the world of health and wellness is that i got into the whole raw food movement mm-hmm. and pretty much every girl that i knew at that time that was also doing it if she had been doing it long enough you know a few months had lost their period and back then actually a funny story is that Some have even thought that that actually was healthy, that that was healthy, that you didn't have a period anymore, you weren't bleeding, you didn't notice it. And that was a story that was kind of going on in the vegan slash raw food world that, oh, you know, you don't need a period uh, uh, or you shouldn't be having bleeding every month. It should actually be nothing. And, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of different aspects, but bottom line, your body will always compensate when it's not getting what it needs. And you see that even more so with women who are not getting what they need or not feeding their body what they need at the time or being forced into a system that was really maybe developed for a dietary method for a man that was, that was perfected on men and then having the challenges that come along with it. Yes. Yes. So 
I want to go to when you help and you're orchestrating a plan for patients of yours and all these women and men that you've helped too, but we're talking specifically about eating, eating and training and kind of operating according to those phases in the cycle. When you work on putting a protocol together for them, um, how do you help them learn all this and remember when to do what it is that there is to do? Because just even as you're explaining it, I'm sure a lot of people are like, wait, okay, so that sounds like a lot. How am I supposed to do all that stuff? Yeah. I mean, we always, you know, whenever I'm thinking about goals for a patient, it's, or, or someone that I'm working with, it's like, okay, where, what's the first domino? Like people will come in and be like, I want this and this and this. And that's <laughs> actually, uh, you know, when we were talking before about evidence-based, that's actually part of evidence-based medicine, right? We have like what, what we know about in the, from the literature, then we have the clinical experience of the clinician. And then the third part of that Venn diagram, when we're, when we're trying to create evidence-based protocols is actually the goals and dreams of the patient or the goals and dreams of the, of the person that you're working with. So someone will say, this is the end result that I want. So I like to uh, divide goals from outcome goals, which is what that is. Like, I want to lose 10 pounds. I want to run a marathon. I want to put on five pounds of lean muscle mass. That's an outcome goal. And so I like to delineate between an outcome goal and a behavioral goal. So the behavioral goal feeds always into the outcome, right? So we, if we want to lose 10 pounds, there's a behavioral goal that has to happen. I need to uh, play around with my macronutrients through my cycle, like Dr. Stephanie said, or I need to uh, work out, or I need to maybe play around with time-restricted eating. So we, we want to develop behavioral goals that are going to feed into that. So um, I did a, a little Instagram story like a couple of weeks ago now, but I, uh, every day, like every Tuesday I know for me is like leg day. That's the day where I go to my, I have a little uh, home gym um, and I will, you know, go and like punish my legs. <laughs> so um, I know that that's what's going to happen every Tuesday. But if my outcome goal, if I only had set outcome goals for myself, meaning, okay, I got to do this amount of weight and I got to do it in this amount of time and I got to take this amount of, you know, um, uh, space or rest periods between my sets, then I, I would if I wake up on Tuesday and maybe I didn't have a good sleep that night or maybe the kids were up or, you know, whatever's happening at work, if I wake up and I'm not able to punch that out, if I only have outcome goals to, to um, sit on, then I would have failed. But a behavioral goal is like, go downstairs and do the legs, like just do the squats. Maybe you need to play with the weights there. Maybe they're a little lighter today. Maybe you take a little bit more rest in between your sets, you know, but that behavioral goal allows me to then uh, it, th those are the building blocks that create the foundation for the outcome goal that you're looking for. So depending on where somebody is, it's always uh, a matter of looking at the outcome goal and then creating behavioral goals that are going to feed into that. And honestly, sometimes it's so sometimes like the most profound thing that I've worked with uh, clients on is drinking more water. And I, and I know that that's like crazy, but you would be you would be shocked to know when I like so I'll say to uh, there's a client that I'm working with right now I'm like okay before you eat anything you have to drink an eight ounce glass of water and wait twenty minutes and then if you're still hungry then eat and you would be shocked she is like you know what I I I was confusing hunger and thirst like this whole time like this whole time I'm like 35 and like I've been confusing it this whole time because they actually feel like the same thing um so you know if you're someone who's listening and you're like oh my god I think I do that like we all do it um but meeting the person where they are and then constructing behavioral goals as I was saying that lead to the outcome that and that's how you get it so it's kind of like the old adage like how do you eat an elephant you know it's like one you know one bite at a time you know you take pieces. So, you know, you'll take the nutrition piece, you take the exercise piece, you take the mindset piece, you take the self-care piece, you take sexual health, brain health, like you take all these things and we just add like a couple of behavioral goals around them. And then once those are established, then you can layer on them uh, and you can, and then they become more sophisticated and more difficult with, with time, but they're only as difficult as, um, uh, as the, as the, you know, it's never like, I'm never setting somebody up to fail, right? Like I want someone to feel like they're winning. So, um, there's like a little, uh, 
I'll always ask someone like out of, out of 10, like, how do you feel? Like, tell me your confidence in being able to punch this out this week. And if it's anything less than an eight, then we, then we change the, we change the plan. I love that. And, and that really echoes another point, which is that all these goals, we do them because we want to ultimately feel a particular way. We don't, you know, I was talking with the Dr. Andrew Huberman the other day and he was saying, you know, you want, you don't take money. You don't want money so that you can take it and then shove it into your brain so that your neurons can interact with the money. Like you think that money is going to give you something mm. and it will in the society that we are in, but then what is that that you think it's going to give you? And then why is that important to you? What do you think you're going to get from it? So it's the feeling that we yeah. often want. So, so far we've talked about diet and we've talked about a little bit about movement. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we can expand on movement, but what are the other things that relate to the feeling, the feeling of being that eight out of 10 each week? Uh, our diet is one piece of it, but what else is there, especially when it comes to women and the phase of their cycle? What else is important that you want to touch on that doesn't always get the importance that it uh, needs or the attention that it needs? You know, I think when a woman feels good, and this is, it's a, it's a simple statement, but I hear it all the time when I speak to women. It's like, I just want to feel good in my skin. And that can be, you know, looking great naked. That can be looking great in your clothes. That can be, you know, setting a goal and developing self-trust in your ability to follow through on it. And that kind of leads back into that behavioral versus outcome goal. Like when you set a small little piece of like, you make yourself a little promise and say, okay, like, I know I feel like crap today. I know today is leg day, but I'm going to go do something so that I can still tick off that behavioral goal. I think developing a sense of self-agency and self-trust is really important for women. And I, I honestly think that there is a bit of this lost art in, in, in honoring our rhythms. Like we often want to, you know, punch out, we want to have the accolades, the success, the house, the cars, the things that we think are going to bring us happiness. And what often happens, and this is kind of like this heroine's journey where we follow this masculine energetic, and by the way, this is not anti-male, this is, we all have masculine and female, uh, feminine energies in us, but we follow this masculine type of energy because we think that it's going to bring us this uh, sense of self-agency and this sense of satisfaction around ourselves. And then you climb up the ladder, you know, you climb up the corporate ladder or the, you know, whatever ladder it is. And you're like, holy fuck, like I'm still, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know if I can say that. Oh. Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah. Like I'm, I'm still, um, you know, I'm still unhappy. So it's really about, and that's when we can kind of move into some of the more feminine um, energetic work. And and this is, you know, we don't always start off here. Like I will say, you know, patients that are or women that I work with, um, I will often, we, we start off with some of these goals around weight loss and energy and, you know, but when they work with me for long enough, we, we do start to move into some of these more feminine energetic um, uh, practices and protocols in terms of honoring uh, the rhythm, talking about, you know, how we show up for ourselves in terms of uh, self-love, uh, self-pleasure, what pleasure looks like. And I know pleasure can be kind of like a, you know, a loaded word, but I do mean it both in the sexual sense, but also finding pleasure in every day. There's, there's this book that I read. It's it's phenomenal. It's called The Pleasure Trap. Mm -hmm. And it's this, her name is uh, Stella Resnick. Um, and she's a psychologist. And she talks about this idea that women are so pleasure devoid in our culture. And even when we have it staring at us in the face, we're so scared because we think if we allow it in that now we're going to, uh, we're going to lose it or we're going to, you know, we, the, the second that you're, you know, so happy and you, you know, can experience ecstasy in whatever form that is that you think it's going to be taken from you right away. So you just have this like guard and like not fully surrender and fully allow that pleasure to sort of wash over you. So um, I don't know if that ex exactly answers your question, no, but it does. I, it does. And, you, and I think you touched on a couple of key points and even one of them that, that is there is just even just, uh, on the topic of pleasure, it's how important orgasms are for women, right? Oh my God. Yeah. You've done a few it's videos so on this and you've done a couple, um, education on it. And just like, cause, cause again, we talk so much about diet. We talk so much about sort of working out in the traditional sense, but these aren't always the components. Maybe it's somebody actually needs more pleasure in their life, 
whether it's an orgasm or going out to their favorite coffee shop and just getting a chance to enjoy coffee away and setting boundaries and expectations with everybody in their life that, okay, hey, this time at this, you know, on this day at this time, this is my time. This is my time period here unless there's an emergency for me to put myself first and to actually take some moment to enjoy the things that make me happy. Yeah. And this is kind of what you were saying before, you know, like what's the money for? It's not to like stuff it in your head. Like what is the diet going to do for you? You know, the whole thing that I think people come to nutrition or fitness or, or in the healthcare space, you know, people are seeking help because they want to feel good in themselves. And I think that nutrition is a very, uh, you know, it's an intellectual, I mean, there's like debates and all that. There's a lot of intellect around it, which is, which is fine. But at the end of the day, we want to be able to figure out what you're going to eat so that you, your body feels good when you eat it. You know, like you, you want to be able to feel good in your skin. And part of it is nutrition, of course. Like, I'm not saying that that's not a big part of it. Of course it is. But the, you know, the question, I, I like the question that you're asking when you're like, well, why do you want the money? You know, like, well, why do you want the diet? Why do you want the, why do you want the weight loss? What's it going to give you? You know, what are you going to get if you are able now to actually feel good in your body? Hopefully it's your experience of pleasure is going to expand your experience of your, you know, this container that you get, you get to call home. You're going to enjoy living in your home, in your temple, um, more. So yeah, I'm a big, um, just to kind of circle back on the orgasms and the sex and the pleasure, that is such a big uh, area when, you know, even if we just want to stay above the head and say, listen, it's going to promote BDNF, it's going to promote healthy brain aging, it's going to reduce your cortisol, get you in a parasympathetic state. You know, even if we just kind of want to talk about these sort of, you know, once or twice removed constructs around the orgasm uh, for women, so important. Um, I actually... um, I was saying to you, like, you know, I'm writing a book. I'm not quite ready to kind of talk about it, but one part of the book is like all about orgasms. And um, one of the things that, uh, like, I'll just share with you and your audience now is taking like a seven day orgasm challenge. Like, take a picture of your face before, and then for seven days with either, you know, your partner or, you know, get a toy and call it your partner, and then just get after the orgasm. Like you have an orgasm every day and take a picture in seven days and tell me how different your face looks. Like you will have, like your face will be glowy. You'll be happier. Um, having orgasms is something that should be part of everybody's um, self-care regimen, especially women. And it's like, you know, there's been some debate around like for men, how many should they have and the testosterone and the um, you know, how they can become more estrogenergic after an orgasm. But for women, it's like as many as you can get, ladies, like as many times that you can climax um, that you can is going to impart some of the brain benefits, but you're also just going to feel great. And I think one of the things with women is that we can actually forget about sex if we're not having it. So if you are not having regular orgasms, you're not going to think about having more orgasm. So it's something that I think is really, really important for um, a woman to not only, you know, use toys, but um, I, I, I'm a big fan of actually having a woman discover what actually turns her on with her own hands, because that is going to allow her to communicate to her partner, uh, if there is one, um, what, uh, what she likes. That's great. That's great. Uh, I know we only have a little bit of time here, but I want to talk about some of the variations for women who are in menopause or menopausal, Mm -hmm. how do you think about these factors when they don't have um, the same phases? Well, are those same phases there? What phases do they deal with and how do they think about some of the information? Yeah, this is a good, this is a good question. And this is usually the, I'm so glad you asked this because this is usually the follow-up question. It's like, well, what about me? I'm in menopause. Um, So the same Psych, the same sort of four different phases don't necessarily apply anymore, right? Your ovaries have been now working for four decades or more at the company. They're like, we're going to take, you know, we like our Rolex and we're going to retire. So they don't, they're not producing the estrogens and the progesterones uh, anymore. So now those are primarily produced like your estrogens, uh, your testosterones are now uh, produced primarily uh, from your adrenals and then uh, estrogens from your adipose tissue. So for women who are menopausal, a couple of different considerations we want to think about them. One, uh, they tend to be more hyper uh, or more insulin resistant. So what that means is that when you're taking in carbohydrates, insulin is less effective at removing it from the bloodstream. So 
a ketogenic diet is going to, where we are reducing the carbohydrate load uh, is going to be very important for that woman. However, just like the when you were in your reproductive years, I don't want you there uh, indefinitely. I actually like to cycle uh, a menopausal woman. Uh, we don't we take out the cycling with the carbs. So I was mentioning to you in like week two, we up the carbs. In week four, we up the carbs uh, for a woman who is uh, menstruating or uh, has a menstrual cycle. For a menopausal woman, we do the same thing except we keep the carbs pretty consistent. So the carbohydrate, we will do kind of like a ketogenic diet, and then we'll alternate that with a higher protein. Um, so like a 40-40-20, uh, uh, or we might do like a 50-40-10, uh, you know, you know, kind of depending on, on her. Uh, I'll usually do like a, a fasting glucose, a glucose challenge, and if I can get uh, fasting insulin just to kind of determine where I'm going to play around with her macronutrients. But again, still really thinking about lean muscle mass for her because it's so easy to lose muscle. It's actually really hard to build it. So we want to be thinking about how we can be building muscle through the diet. And one of the ways that I like menopausal women to, I mean, other than resistance training, um, is to do it through uh, cycling their protein up and down. Uh, so I will kind of alternate between keat, like sort of like a high fat and then a high protein, a high fat and then a high protein for uh, menopausal women in terms of um, uh, nutrition. That's great. Um, what, what do you find is essential for a lot of people who, a lot of women especially, who are studying this information when it comes to communication around those around them? Because as you mentioned, there's so many things that falls on the plates of women. They're often doing most of the work inside the home that is the unpaid mm -hmm. work. They have all the social norms and so, sort of societal expectations that are there. And so that might mean if their diet is varying up and they need something different one week or another, it might mean that they're not eating the same thing as their partner or they don't want something or there might be times in their cycle or during these phases where they feel like they want to rest and they have social obligations. So it seems to me like a big part of this is learning how to step into the communication aspect of what you might need. Any tips that you've seen from the women that you've worked with about the best way to do that? I, I love this question so much. I think that um, a lot of times we will put ourselves at the bottom of the list and we'll say, well, you know, I know she said it's really important to do this, but maybe I'll just like eat what everybody's having here. I think the, when you decide that you are actually worthy of eating in a way that your unique biology um, requires of you, it will be easier for you to uh, set boundaries. So when I say, you know, and when I say we're going to increase protein from like 20% to 40%, you know, that's not necessarily, you know, you're not like chugging down like whey protein powder all day long, right? Like if we think about like, you know, you may have an a, a extra steak at, at dinner if you're, if you're a meat eater or uh, you might have, you know, extra protein powder in your shake or that kind of thing. It's not that hard to play around with these uh, compositions in the diet. But I think it's really important for a woman to really acknowledge that she's worth it. Because when we fix the women, we like when the women are actually feeling good. That's when we actually change communities, right? They're like the primary caregivers of the of the uh, um, of the children. They're the ones who typically make the medical decisions in the family. You know, they share information with each other. And I think that there used to be much more of a, you know, when we go back to like more uh, our ancestral patterns, there used to be a lot more sharing of information. And I think that part of that, part of us living in our, you know, single dwelling homes or we're in condos and we don't know our neighbors is that we don't actually get to share this information. So my, like some of the best um, observations that I've made from women who are successful on uh, some of the protocols that I've, that I've given them is that they, they set the boundary and say, you know what, I'm actually, I'm worth it. Like, I'm going to just do this because I, I want to get well. I want to, you know, I have a, like my own personal goal. I want to live, I want to be a super centenarian. I want to live over 110. And in order to do that, I need to make sure that I'm taking care of myself first. It's like the, you know, the airplane demonstration when, you know, there's no oxygen, you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you can assist others. And most women are very uh, naturally, they're nurturers, right? They want to take care of their partner. They want to take care of their children. They want to take care of their friends. And then by the end of the day, they're so spent that they, that they don't have anything left to give to themselves. So 
the women who I have found have been most successful, uh, have their husbands are typically very supportive. Um, and they also make the decision that they're going to say, you know what, like I'm, I'm worth it. Like I have, you know, there's, this is not a rehearsal, like it's life. This is the time I get. So and most women, when I, when I work with them, often they're, they're kind of perimenopause approaching. Men- so they've already done their time, right? Like they're like, I've already put in the sleepless nights and the raising of the kids and the, like, I'm actually ready to give to myself now. So I often find that there's a bit of a, um, uh, the mindset coming into working with it is like, okay, like I've kind of given everything to everyone now. My cup is empty. I'm ready to fill it up. I love that. And then hopefully for younger women that are listening, it's like, we never want you to get to that place. I mean, everybody yeah. has to go through all the journey yeah. is yeah. that, is that they're implementing and incorporating some of these things from a younger age. So they're not at that position where they have built a successful career or successful, successfully raised children or whatever it is that they want to do, but then they feel that they're, that they're missing out of it. So that's a great, great reminder. This whole podcast has been a great reminder uh, for how we can look at things a little bit differently and tweak the approach, right? If any of this has been useful for, you know, our listeners that have been, been listening and they want like, okay, I, while I wait for the book, the Dr. Seema <laughs> book that comes out, where can I learn more? Where can I go to get more information on this? Where do you want to send those individuals uh, to? Oh, well, if you, uh, a couple places, uh, I, my podcast, like we mentioned, Better with Dr. Stephanie, we often do a lot of AMAs. So we have, you know, people will submit questions and a lot of it is, is around nutrition and fitness and um, uh, menopause and perimenopause and all that. So you can have a, have a look there, a lot of free information uh, there, um, stuff that I'm really proud of. Uh, the other place that you can go is estimadiet.com. So E-S-T-I-M-A. D-I-E-T dot com. And there's like a little, I've given, you know, what we've been talking about today, I condense that into like 18 minutes. So it's like a little mini masterclass um, on the Estima diet. And then if you are interested in learning more, there's like a little button and then either myself or my team will respond to you and kind of give you some information and uh, kind of see w- if we can help. So those are kind of the two that, places. That could be either, you know, I know you work with some few clients selectively, right? So it's like a few select group, right. but then there's also like group programs that is a larger thing that people could be. So is that the place they go to if they're interested in either one of those? Yes. Thank you. So if you want, there's, we have a group program called the Estima Diet and that's the, I was mentioning before, I think we have like 1100 women in there now and I'm in there too, uh, facilitating a lot of the conversation. So we can, you can either do like a group program uh, with me, or I do have a select, you know, couple of women that I work with every uh, quarter. Um, so if you're interested in, in, in what that might look like, that would be the same place, like estimadiet.com. And then there's like a little button there. And then that email comes directly to um, either myself or uh, my team. Is there a podcast interview that you did with somebody um, or an Ask Me Anything that would be the next great sort of next step after this conversation, even if it went deeper into one of the aspects that we, we covered? Is there one that you can think of that would be a, could be a good next step if anybody's listening and they're like, ah, oh, I want more of this incredible woman, you know, we can show them that this could be a great next step. Yeah, AMA number five and number six. So those are um, the, mo- the, the most two recent um, Ask Me Anything episodes that we did. The AMA six, we talked a lot about menopausal uh, exercise. We talked about menopausal uh, diet considerations. And AMA number five was a lot of the Estima protocol. So there's a lot more of the things that we, you and I were discussing today. So those would be the two, um, uh, the two podcasts that would give you a lot of a lot of the information that we've been discussing here today. Amazing. So we'll have the links to all those in the show notes, especially those podcasts and everything else that uh, Dr. Estima uh, mentioned. Thank you for living up to the expectation that you always have of being somebody who's really thoughtful, breaks things down, and has practical information that's there for the audience to follow. I so appreciate you coming back on the podcast and educating our guests on something that, again, I think that we could do, you know, you could probably have a pod, a whole nother podcast, you know, <laughs> that's dedicated, like an entire podcast where every episode each week was focused on just this topic and it still wouldn't be enough to really educate the audience that's out there. So that's just shows how much people are craving for, and especially women are craving for this information. So Stephanie, thank you so much for being on the Broken Rain podcast and sharing your knowledge with us. 
you know, time with you, Drew, is almost always time well spent. I always enjoy my time with you, and I can't wait to be able to see you and Yasmin in person. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, so are we. Thank you so much. 